Good evening, and welcome to Chrononauts, a science fiction literature history podcast. I'm Nate, and I'm joined by my co-host, JM. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. I'm ready to conquer the West and other planets. Oh, yes. Yes, it'll it'll definitely be an interesting conquest, that's for sure. You can find us on all of the major podcast platforms, like Spotify and Apple. We are also on YouTube. You can also find us on Twitter at SF. We have a blog spot where we post certain texts and translations at chrononautspodcast.blogspot.com. And we also have a band camp where we post some of the music, also chrononautspodcast.bandcamp.com. Tonight we're going to be looking at four stories in the Edisonade or Edisonade subgenre. And we're going to begin our story tonight in perhaps a strange place on Shoreham, New York, in Long Island which was the site where, in 1901 to 1902, Nikola Tesla built Wardenclyffe Tower as the site of his experiments in the transmission of wireless power. The project was a total failure, and the tower was demolished and sold for scrap in 1917, and the property foreclosed in 1922. The laboratory buildings on the property went through a number of owners afterwards, a Walter L. Johnson from Brooklyn, Plant Acres Incorporated, Peerless Photo Products, and AGFA Corporation, who closed the facility in 1992. However, the webcomic, The Oatmeal, in 2012 raised several million dollars to purchase the site and fund the creation of a Tesla museum, which they did in 2013. The museum is still under construction, and in 2018, the Wardenclyffe site was listed on the National Register of Historic Places. I think COVID kind of interfered with the opening of the site, and it might be open on a limited basis, but I'm not sure if it's completely open to the general public yet. I think that's going to be coming in the next couple of years. While the Oatmeal comic was wildly successful, both in terms of fundraising and reach on the internet as a whole, it is wildly inaccurate and contains a great deal of information that at best are oversimplifications and at worst are outright falsehoods. Unfortunately, this comic informs much of the modern discourse surrounding Edison and Tesla in the broader internet sphere. The idea of which was Tesla single-handedly invented the modern world and Edison stole it all from him. People like this kind of underdog story and I think equally alluring as someone like an Edison established as a genius and a foundational figure of modern society, really having this like dark secret and dark side and being a terrible person in real life. I mean, yeah. after all, it's true about Columbus and many of the founding fathers, so why not Edison as well? Yeah, I mean, I, I this is kind of surprising to me because, I mean, I I do remember in the last 10 years, there seemed to be a, a, in a sudden uprising of interest in Tesla. Yeah. <laughs> but I'd heard a bit of a rivalry, but I mm -hmm. didn't realize that Edison had been so vilified and yeah. Tesla was like the hero of this story and that it was this was the narrative that was being painted. It's kind of new to me and surprising, I guess. I mean, that it's that big of a deal, you know, that's taking right. that seriously, I guess. Y yeah, and the portrait that's being painted here really does frame it as a rivalry between the two figures, even though they really had very little contact with one another in the course of their lives. And real life is just more complicated than that kind of narrative. So... Over the next couple of minutes, let's try to demystify both Edison and Tesla, as there's a lot of bad information floating around about both. Possibly the best biography on Edison is Paul Israel's Edison, A Life of Invention. And if you really want to get into the Edison weeds, the Edison papers are absolutely enormous and span seven volumes of huge books. Gives you all the primary documents you could ever want about the man's career. So Thomas Edison was born in 1847 in Ohio. His mother was a school teacher and taught him basic reading, writing, and arithmetic skills. Like many electrical practitioners of his day, Edison got his start with a telegraph, working at the Louisville, Kentucky Western Union in 1866, where he started his experimenting. His first patent was for a vote recorder in 1869, and was taken under the wing of Franklin Pope, the elder brother of Ralph Pope, who we met in the previous episode, in Elizabeth, New Jersey. The two of them formed Pope Edison and Company Electrical Engineers, which operated between 1869 and 1870. Their most notable development during this period was the one-wire stock ticker. 
During the short-lived partnership, Edison had established a foothold in the New York, New Jersey area and had built his famous Menlo Park Laboratory in 1876. His first major invention here was the phonograph in 1877, the first device which could play back recorded sound. And in 1879, he demonstrated his famous light bulb. It should be said that Edison didn't invent the light bulb, but rather he invented a practical incandescent bulb, which could reliably be used without burning out very quickly. The light bulb and the phonograph both made him a lot of money, and Edison turned his attention towards designing a power distribution system, which could in part run his light bulbs. In 1882, the world's first power system, providing 110 volts of DC to 59 customers, was switched on in his station at Pearl Street in Lower Manhattan. One of Edison's biggest competitors, Westinghouse, had a great deal of stake in transformer research for an alternating current distribution system, which was different than Edison's model. When Nikola Tesla's AC motor was developed, this gave Westinghouse the edge from a technical sense, as Edison stubbornly clung to DC, and then the so-called War of Currents came to an end in 1892, which was Edison and Westinghouse's rivalry over the establishment of a power distribution system, whether it would be DC, Edison system, or AC, the Westinghouse system. This came to an end in 1892 with the restructuring of several of Edison's companies, forming General Electric out of one of the mergers. AC had won out in the end, and it's pretty much the system that we use for power distribution today. Probably Edison's other major technical achievement was his early involvement in the motion picture industry. Of particular note to this podcast is his production of the earliest known film adaptation of Frankenstein. However, technical achievement or no, as Israel notes, possibly Edison's most important legacy was his development of what is the modern research and development laboratory. Edison knew the commercial end as well as the technical end and had his fingers in pretty much every emerging technology at the time. Setting up a management structure where he had teams of people working on different projects, figuring out what works, what could sell, what couldn't, basically set the blueprint for Bell Labs, Silicon Valley, and all the other important R&D labs of the 20th century. This is largely what allowed him to build the enormous business empire that he did, the willingness to experiment and adapt and manage that process. Business emperor he certainly was, but he was certainly not as cruel as some of the anti-Edison sources may portray him. For instance, the film Electrocuting an Elephant, where the elephant Topsy, who had previously killed a drunk, was executed by electrocution. And this is often cited as the depths Edison would sink in the War of Currents, depicting AC as dangerous. However, The film was produced in 1903, over a decade after the War of Currents, and Edison himself seemed to have no involvement in the actual production of the film. This leads into one charge against Edison that I think is fair. He branded everything his company did under his own name. Edison appears everywhere in the branding of the intellectual property, even if the work was done by members of his team and not by him personally. And, you know, to be fair, there are business and branding reasons why this is done, but it does lead people in the public to possibly perceive that Edison was involved personally with more than he actually was, both in terms of the film production and some of the technical stuff. Regarding the Topsy situation, the Edison company never really used this as a, like, see, look how dangerous this type stuff is, type of PSA. And the Edison Papers notes that the Luna Park initially planned to hang Topsy, but the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to animals objected, claiming that this method of execution was unnecessarily cruel. Yeah, I mean, imagine hanging an elephant. Jeez. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they had like a crane that they were going yeah. to do that from. It's pretty grotesque scene. But the execution had been planned for months after Topsy had killed a spectator who, you know, to be fair, was abusing and being quite cruel to the elephant. But if anybody is to blame for Topsy's mistreatment, it's definitely on the circus's end. And I don't mention this to defend Topsy's electrocution, as no matter how you slice it, it is a real nasty piece of unpleasant business. But I think it's important to ground events like this properly in history. Otherwise, you get these bizarre charges that Edison was just out there zapping animals to get back at Tesla. Likewise, the rumors that he offered money for live dogs and cats to electrocute are just completely ridiculous. 
Bernie Carlson, the author of the Tesla biography we'll be getting into in a bit, says that there's no proof of this. And Israel refers to the charge that Edison killed a laboratory assistant through his own incompetence in X-ray experiments as nonsense. As X-ray technology was still very new at the time, and many early X-ray experimenters outside of Edison's shop also met with nasty, unpleasant ends. While a competitive executive and a demanding employer, he was a workaholic and generally respected by the engineering community, aside from Tesla, who did harbor an animosity for him for much of his life. And when Edison died in 1931, he left behind a sprawling set of businesses, some of which are still around in some form to this day. Now, Tesla, probably the best source of good information on him is the Bernard Carlson book, Tesla, inventor of the electrical age. So we recommend this one for those who want a deeper, more accurate portrait of the man. Nikola Tesla was ethnically Serbian. He was born in 1856 in Smiljan in modern-day Croatia, then part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. As such, was Tesla a Serb or a Croat is a fun debate you can have online yeah. in addition to the usual <laughs> Tesla versus Edison stuff. I have a friend who would definitely say, oh, Croatian. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, a lot of people do. That, that <laughs> argument <Slow-wa. laughs> has been played out quite a bit on, on Wikipedia. <laughs> Tesla's father was a priest in the Serbian Orthodox Church, and Nikola found an interest in electricity and inventing from an early age. Fascinated by the static electricity, on the fur of his black cat, combined with his mother's inventiveness with improvising tools to improve efficiency of household work, Nikola took easily to inventing and engineering. Unlike Edison, Tesla fashioned himself as an idealistic thinker, the kind of person who can envision something in his mind in a theoretical sense rather than hashing it out through the workbench or in sketches. Despite his innate intelligence and brilliance, Tesla also suffered from these intense, nightmarish images and was a witness to his brother's death in a horse riding accident. Afterwards, his relationship with his father became rather strained. He did excel at math in school, and took a great interest in the novels of Mark Twain. The two would later become friends after he moved to America. Tesla was admitted to the Johannium Polytechnic School in Graz, Austria, and at Graz he learned a great deal about physics, in particular the emerging field of electrical and magnetic fields, and had first started to think about the problem of an AC motor around this time. AC had first been demonstrated by Hippolyte Pixie in 1832, but a functional practical system did not yet exist at this time. Tesla didn't finish up his studies at Graz. Instead, he picked up a gambling addiction and was arrested for vagrancy in 1879. Over the next couple years, he worked in Prague and Budapest, And at Ivry, a suburb of Paris, he was employed by the local Edison organization there in 1882 and moved to Strasbourg, where he built his first motor in 1883. His work in France had caught the attention of Charles Batchelor, who was one of the higher-ups at the Edison company, and was given an offer to work in the New York Edison Machine Works in 1884. Tesla's first impressions of America were not so great. He stated in his autobiography, quote, Is this America? I asked myself in painful surprise. It is a century behind Europe in civilization. But regardless, Tesla started to do work here and spent the rest of his life in America. He designed an arc lighting system during his six-month tenure for Edison, and the project was shelved and went unused. So Tesla was quite irked at this and quit and established the Tesla Electric Light and Manufacturing Company in Rahway, New Jersey. Over the next few years, Tesla made several patents related to electric lighting and had turned his attention back to the AC motor. In 1887, he had invented a new polyphase AC motor, and the system surrounding it encompassed seven patents, which were issued in 1888. Urged by his lawyer, Tesla also filed a number of two-wire patents, which were more commercially applicable at the time, giving Tesla an incredible amount of intellectual property rights over these very important emerging new technologies. Tesla gave a lecture to the American Institute of Electrical Engineers in 1888, promoting his motor and system, which were crucial components in what is essentially a modern functioning AC transmission system. His motor found him an incredible amount of financial success, and esteem in the community. 
However, as Carlson notes, and what many of the kind of hagiographic pieces on Tesla lack, is that Tesla's motor wasn't just successful because it worked, but because Tesla and his lawyers knew how to spin it. They knew how to put on a dramatic presentation. And put on dramatic presentations he did. Tesla was constantly firing off in newspapers, defending his ideas and inventions, as well as putting down those of others, sometimes in very personal terms. Tesla also conducted these numerous public demonstrations, often involving enormous Tesla coils, whose aesthetic appearance is certainly one of the biggest nonfiction influences in the art of science fiction. The Universal Frankenstein film in particular is a good oh, yeah. example of this. There's also a really great photo of Tesla and Mark Twain, where Mark Twain is holding one of Tesla's cool-looking lighting devices. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Tesla started to think about wireless transmission in the early 1890s, particularly wireless transmission of power, and he developed a wireless lighting system. And the Wardenclyffe Tower is where he ultimately focused his research in this area. Financially backed by J.P. Morgan, the tower was completed in 1902. And, I mean, talk about influencing science fiction. This thing is one of the most science fiction-y looking structures ever to exist in the real world. It's just absolutely incredible. Unfortunately, Tesla was incorrect about the physics. He disagreed with Heinrich Hertz and Oliver Lodge and rejected the Maxwellian view of physics, which is what has been considered the correct model for the past 100 years. Tesla also thought that wireless was pushed through the Earth and did not believe that electrons existed. And as such, the tower wasn't able to produce results. It was a massive failure. His financial backers pulled out, and the project wasn't just a failure from a technical standpoint, but Tesla's reputation suffered a massive blow that he never recovered from. His views on Maxwellian physics had made him quickly obsolete and was soon eclipsed by an emerging field of electronics, that is the physics of vacuum tubes. He was left behind by those who had followed in his wake. Later in his life, he was living on a pension from the Yugoslavian government in a tiny room in the Hotel New Yorker in squalid conditions. His proclamations of inventions became more and more fantastical, and he was taken less and less seriously by the public and the engineering community. He frequently fed pigeons by the cathedral, and in 1937 was struck by a taxi cab, which he never recovered from. Prominent members of the American Institute of Electrical Engineers were so concerned about his condition that in 1942, they brought up the issue of Tesla's poverty and what financial assistance might be appropriate almost 60 years after his landmark speech to them on AC. He died the following year in 1943 in his hotel room, a rather sad end to an incredible visionary. Like with Edison, there's quite a few tall tales about Tesla and their interactions with one another should be taken with a grain of salt. According to Israel, there is evidence to suggest that the two men might have met in person once, possibly twice, and the anecdote about Edison refusing to pay Tesla, citing, quote, you don't understand American humor, is almost certainly completely fabricated. A lot has been written about Tesla, suggesting that he single-handedly invented nearly all modern technologies, but his life can really be summed up as being one major success, the AC motor, and one major failure, Wardenclyffe. And again, we suggest the Carlson book for an accurate scholarly painting of the man, as the real man is a far more interesting complex figure than his legacy in popular culture may suggest. It's certainly more complex than any of the figures we'll be talking about later on oh, yeah. in the episode. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> There's a great transcription of a radio program posted online of a conversation between Carlson and Israel regarding Edison and Tesla and cutting through some of the myths, which is also great if you want something a little more digestible than book-length text but something that has actual substance, unlike certain webcomics and other internet sources. In particular, Carlson says that, quote, Edison is almost unique in that he is able to do brilliant things at the bench top. I think of a lot of times when people get started on this, oh, Edison just steals from people, and he was always just really an industrialist. They haven't actually gone back and looked at the thousands of pages of notebooks that Edison filled up with sketches, and they approach in their richness the notebooks of Leonardo da Vinci. And when we think about Edison's reputation, we don't want to do it in a binary way. Oh, you're either the industrialist, you're doing the business thing, or you're just a geek you're in the evil. laboratory with the, <laughs> yeah, right, with the uh, beat up old glasses. Electrocuting and animals and stealing people's pets. Right. So. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. Carlson says that Edison was both. He was both the businessman and he was both 
the guy in the lab. I find the phonograph stuff really interesting. Yeah. The basic underlying technology is pretty simple. It's the conversion of mechanical vibrations reproduced through a loudspeaker. Right. There's a vibrating stylus that imprints grooves on a material. Right. He eventually settled on foil, I believe. Yeah, foil was one of the earliest mediums. There was a device called the phone autograph, which was invented about a couple of years earlier, which was able to record sound but not play it back. So what that did is it etched vibrations on foil, whereas Edison's phonograph could actually play it back. The commercial application of this was in the form of these wax cylinders that had the vibrations etched on the outer shell of the cylinder. This was how recorded music was sold for the first couple of decades before the modern record format would come along, which is much more efficient and easier to work with than the cylinders. But yeah, it, it, it makes up the essentially beginning of the recorded music industry. Yeah. He did experiment with a few different materials. Yeah. And I think he did sort of abandon the wax pretty quickly. Yeah. And what's interesting to me, too, is that people didn't really see the practical applications of this. Right. And right. so when he first developed it, even though he had all these really inventive ideas for what it might be used for, and he, a lot of his notebooks are probably filled with oh, yeah. speculations like that. Yeah. You can kind of picture him and the staff of the Menlo Park Laboratory just sort of getting together and brainstorming ideas. But a lot of what it was first used for was was toys. Right, dolls. And I remember dolls. getting toys that were very similar to Edison's idea right. in, in the, as late as the 1980s. Yeah. And they were just these mechanically powered devices that had pictures on it, and you would pull the string... And there was a little record inside, and it would play a little tune or say something really silly yeah. <laughs> or make animal noises. Right, right. That's the kind of thing that it's like, oh, you just invented this amazing device. Uh, this is what it's going to be used for. Right. And a lot of these early inventions, they don't really have the same application that the technology might transform into and we might think of in the modern era. So, for instance, Edison also invented an electric pen, which was... I guess his idea of trying to make writing more efficient, maybe faster, yeah, something like that, which didn't catch on in his day as far as what he intended it for, but has modern applications in modern tattoo guns. Yeah. People said it was so uncomfortable to hold and use. Yeah. <laughs> so he had a lot of really interesting ideas that didn't actually get off the ground. Right. Concrete housing and furniture was another one. Yeah. There's some cool names in the biography the Wizard of Menlo Park, which is actually the one I was looking at, mm -hmm. there's excerpts of some cool <laughs> speculations on what you could actually name a photograph. Because right. it had to be branded, right? And this was very important. We got names like the Cosmophone, <laughs> the Acoustophone, yeah. the Telautograph, the Autophone, or the Antiphone. Yeah. And it goes on. There's there's tons of them. Chronophone. <laughs> Didascophone, yeah. because they were thinking of, of marketing it to different institutions, you see. So the didascophone would be an educational aid. Right, right. And the autophone would be a dictation machine. Mm -hmm. And the telautograph would be for sending recordings. I don't know. They probably He probably envisioned like sending records in the mail and stuff like that. You know, yeah. you, putting them in shops and yeah, anticipating the recording industry, like you said. But... The idea took a while to take off, and people were actually experiencing the sort of uncanny aspect of it in that because they were so unused to hearing recorded sound, when they heard the sound coming out of a speaker of a human voice, sometimes they didn't even recognize it as a human voice. Right. Now, to be fair, maybe the quality wasn't all that great. Yeah. I mean, certainly in, in the ones that you had to crank, actually not crank in order to crank up a spring, but crank in order to actually get it to move. Yeah. You know what I mean? The speed might be variable and it might sound wild. Yeah. And, and I mean, yeah. if you weren't very consistent with it, right, the speed would be all wrong. <laughs> right. But it wasn't long before he figured out a way to make it automatic. So you didn't have to sit there basically cranking the player in order to get it to rotate. Mm 
Mm-hmm. But even so, people were so unaccustomed to this idea that they didn't recognize what they were hearing was speech sometimes until they were told to expect it. Yeah. Which I think is a really interesting perceptual phenomenon, actually. No, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, we're getting into the weeds here, but I just... Edison and Tesla are pretty interesting, and we're coming to something that I'm going to have a little trouble with, and I'm going to have to vent some (laughs) spleen. So Yeah, and I think it's important to set the background here as, while Tesla doesn't pop up in any of the stories tonight, he does have his own story. Unfortunately, Two Mars with Tesla is not available online, and according to Jess Nevins in the Encyclopedia of Fantastic Victoriana, it's a terrible novel but sounds strange enough to warrant an honorable mention here. One more quote from that radio program from Carlson, who says, quote, So I have a cultural theory about this, and that is the perception of Edison being a villain in popular culture. And that is, for the success of any technology in the modern economy in the 19th and 20th century, you've got two types of people. You've got to have the visionaries that had the brilliant idea, tied to wishes and dreams, begin to actually make it work. And then you need the hard-nosed types that are basically actually going to build the business, scale up the system, drive down the costs, make things happen. And when the economy is doing all right, then guys like Edison, you could also throw Henry Ford in there. They're seen as being acceptable heroes. When the economy turns soft or you go through a recession like we just did recently, all of a sudden you begin to look around for these visionaries that are going to bring up the technology that is going to get us out of the current set of social and economic problems. And so Tesla is now much more regarded as a hero, and that's where we are sadly with Edison in the popular culture. He is the villain that we have to have in order to elevate the heroes. Not the last action hero, that's no. just the, the shitty 80s man, <laughs> yeah. Tesla. But let's talk about how these two fit into the science fiction literature here. The term Edisonade or Edisonade, I'm not entirely sure how it's pronounced, I've heard it pronounced both ways. I think it would vary according to your preference. Uh, yeah. I, I'd probably be more inclined to say it as an odd, but yeah. it doesn't really matter because right. it's it's a term made up in 1993 by John Clute. So. Right. But it does come from the idea of the Robinson odd, which is a yes. tale inspired by Robinson Crusoe. Right. Which makes perfect sense. Yes, absolutely. And this was coined, as you said, by John Clute and Peter Nichols in 1993 in the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction, which was to describe a series of American pulp novels largely following in the wake of Steam Man of the Prairies, involving these boy-inventor-type protagonists. In addition to being inspired by Edison as an inventor, Edison, or people named after Edison, like Tom Edison Jr., appear in a number of these dime novels, Uh, Tesla even getting one in the form of Two Mars with Tesla. It should be noted that the presence of Edison and Tesla in these juvenile-type stories really shows how much like celebrities both men were at the time, and both are being portrayed as heroes for younger audiences. As far as the development of the Edisonade goes, we covered Steam Man of the Prairies back in Episode 7, so we won't go into too much detail about it here other than that it was from 1868 and substantially predates everything we are reading tonight. Yeah, listen to that one. Yeah, listen to that one for more detail. On we don't like it very story. much. No. <laughs> but I think here we're going to take a quick break and pick up with one of the genre's most prolific authors, which will allow us to get from the 1870s to the 90s, and the long-lasting legacy on the science fiction publication industry these stories had, which was primarily from the publications angle, and as I think we'll see, these stories here aren't exactly the greatest when it comes to ideas or prose, but there were a lot of them. Hundreds, if not thousands, which possibly shaped the form of science fiction, would take as a marketing genre just as much as better written works from Wells and Fern would for the ideas. So before we get into the stories themselves, we should give a little bit of introduction on some of the historical developments of the Edisonade. As our first author, 
was one of the most prolific in the genre. A lot of the background information on this can be found in the Encyclopedia of Fantastic Victoriana by Jess Nevins, and Science Fiction, The Early Years by Everett F. Blyler, which are two absolutely indispensable texts if you're going to be looking deeply into the genre. Two absolutely massive tomes oh, yeah. that attempt to, I guess, uncover and somewhat elucidate some of the very early and often very obscure works yeah. that influence this genre. Yeah. There are a lot of these stories, and very few of them are online. A lot of these were published on newsprint, and you can really only find them in certain research libraries that hold research collections on science fiction history. It's unlikely that any of this stuff is going to be republished anytime soon. Some of it is on Gutenberg. Other texts are available elsewhere on the web. We're not entirely sure that we recommend you read these texts tonight. There is certainly a great deal of these novels out there, and none of them, well, so far have been particularly good. After Steam Man of the Prairies, the novel from 1868, was republished as number 40 in Beatles Pocket Novels in January of 1876. Under its third title, no less. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of these works also have a lot of titles, which can also make it difficult to keep the novels straight. Kind of like a 1970s Euro exploitation Ex Exactly, movie. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, though There's... possibly even nastier than the Euro exploitation stuff. Yeah, in um, some ways. Yeah. Uh, and I want to talk about that, but yeah. we'll get there. Oh, definitely. We'll definitely get there. But a rival publisher named Frank Tusi commissioned an author named Harry Enton to write Frank Reed and his Steam Man of the Plains, or The Terror of the West, which was published serially from February 28th to April 24th of 1876 under the pseudonym No Name in the publication Boys of New York. Yeah, that boy bodes well. Yeah. And No Name was used as a pseudonym for not only just all the Frank Reed stuff, but a lot of these Edison odds. And we'll see who No Name was because No Name was a couple of people. Enton wrote four Reed stories in total, and he had a dispute with Tusi over credit. He basically wanted to be credited under his own name and not no name. I like this Frank Reed guy. I want to claim him. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so Enton quits. And Tusi hires a Luis Sinarins, whose first story was Frank Reed Jr. and his Steam Wonder from 1882. Yeah, so that's how you get away with not giving the guy credit. He's making his son now. Exactly. The old guy suddenly retired. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> aged dad. Right. Being bettered by his son. Yeah. Sonarans wrote 174 of the 182 stories in the Frank Reed Jr. series, which Nevin describes as, quote, the racism is more poisonous, the position of whites is more privileged, and the idea of America's manifest destiny is more implicitly taken for granted. The plotting is lazier, the cruelty more sadistic, the adventures bloodier, the dialogue more awkward, the violence and sadism rendered more acutely, and the facts more badly researched and incorrect. And we will definitely find that this also describes the work that we're going to be coming to tonight. Despite this, Reed Jr. was easily the most prolific and popular of its type at the time. Sonarans also wrote entries in the Jack Wright series, also under the pseudonym No Name, which is apparently the exact same stuff as the Frank Reed Jr. series. Has yes. 121 entries, though it's not exactly clear how many are written by Sonarans himself. So, Sonarans himself was born in 1865 and started writing dime novels at the age of 14. When the Frank Reed Library launched, he wrote one of these every two weeks, and I think it <laughs> definitely shows. But he wrote a total of 1,500 books under 27 pseudonyms, presumably more or less all the same kind of stuff. Pulling technological ideas here and there from Jules Verne novels and repackaging it. Apparently some of the plots. Jack Wright stories get pretty wild. Like he meets yeah. Atlantean survivors and I think he goes to like the moon or something. Or right. Gets, it gets a little more out there, but same kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. One example in the Frank Reed series is Frank Reed Jr. and his Queen Clipper of the Clouds, which is almost certainly a Jules Verne ripoff. Maybe more so than Angel of the Revolution. Uh, I don't know. 
Uh, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. I'm sure an excruciating challenge would be for somebody to try to read all 1,500 of these novels, if it would oh. be even possible to do. I don't know if all of them survived. Drugs don't help. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that is the biggest Edisonad author and series. And a lot of the other series are kind of also following in this formula. We're going to be reading a story from the Electric Bob series, as well as the Tom Edison Jr. series, which were, again, more or less the same kind of thing. Technical ideas pulled from Jules Verne, written in this very imperialistic, racist manner, but trying to appeal to juveniles. Yeah. It's very slapdashly written because, yeah, you can tell two weeks, probably not much editorship going exactly. on either. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean... These are, these are tough, and I think people have sometimes brought up this point that I don't always agree with, that there's nothing in pulp that really stands up to scrutiny and that it's only of historical interest, mm -hmm. but it definitely applies here. I, I would say so, yeah. I think usually we like to recommend at least something out of the stuff we read. I don't think we can really do that today. I think if you're interested in this kind of stuff, by all means, go for it. Just know what you're getting into. Yeah. People do sometimes maybe over, sort of overemphasize just how intense something can be. But in this case, the language used and the contents itself, the racism is really off the scale. It is. It really and is. And there's no getting around it. Yeah. And this was meant for kids too, which is yeah. sort of almost insidious. Quite yeah. disturbing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wanted to find a history of children's literature, specifically addressing how racism and class and that kind of thing were marketed and packaged to children. I came up short on that and wasn't really able to find anything. It's not really my field, but it'd be an interesting angle to look at because the racism and imperialism stuff really come out a lot more here than I think in anything else we've covered on the podcast. And while a lot of these early works can be criticized for being imperialist and colonialist and all that stuff, I think the Edison odds are by far the most exemplary of that type of negative writing. Far more so than Jules Verne. Oh yeah, far more so. Like, yeah. And he often gets hit with that label. And I think quite unfairly. I think quite unfairly. And I think maybe people are thinking of crap like this that is churned out at an incredible pace and has no real thought behind it. Whereas Byrne, I think, was very thoughtful in his works and maybe not altogether consistent with some of the values and morality that he was trying to get across, but it's certainly nothing along the lines of this, which is just egregiously racist and imperialist all, all the way through. But as we have pointed out before, the English translations that people would have read of Byrne at this time Right. And even as much as 100 years later, yeah. were heavily truncated, and a lot of the stuff that was taken out is exactly the stuff that we've just talked about, mm -hmm. which is Varen's more philosophical side, his more speculative, ruminative side, and that stuff was seen as unimportant. Right. And at times, not only were things taken out, but whole sentences were constructed that yeah. were not in the right. original French right. text. So that would have... Definitely contributed to people like Mark Twain, who said something like, Oh, that rampaging French lunatic. <laughs> Didn't think too highly of him. And uh, no. we'll be getting to something a little later that, that actually might be a bit of a commentary on this kind of stuff. When we do cover Mark Twain on Chrononauts, yeah. which we will. Yes, we will. Because he has some things of interest. And he was definitely knowledgeable about this kind of stuff that was being published yeah. in his lifetime. So. And he's certainly very good at what he does. Yeah, he likes to poke at people and yeah. uh, satirize things. He's one yeah. of the best. Yeah. However, the story we read tonight is certainly not one of the best. This is Frank Reed Jr. and his new Steam Man, or The Young Inventor's Trip to the Far West. It is the first title in the Frank Reed Library, which was published on September 21st, 1892. But I'm not sure of its actual sequence in the Frank Reed Jr. series, nor am I sure of that exact publication date, as this might be a republication. I'm not exactly sure, though I doubt it really matters in the long run. 
the Frank Reed Library was a dedicated publication to publishing just these Frank Reed stories. And it was on newsprint, like all the other stories we've read tonight, and quite important from a publishing standpoint, as these were extremely popular and targeted towards a younger audience. No doubt some of the people who would read this as a kid would go on to write stories in the 1910s and 1920s. And it really laid down, in a sense, some of the genre's earliest tropes, including the inventor-type character. So while these are definitely not good stories, they are at least historically important from a publishing standpoint. And I'm definitely not going to recommend reading any of these first three here. Maybe the last one, when we get into it, we'll talk about that a little more. But yeah. this Frank Reed Jr. is really one of the absolute worst, if not the worst thing we've covered for the podcast so far. Sorry, I know you said it didn't matter very much, but I do have a publication date of September 24th, 1892. Yeah, right. That was the title in the Frank Reed Library. And I know other titles in the Frank Reed Library were republications of earlier Frank Reed stories. So I don't know if the 1892 date was when New Steam Man was initially published, or if it was just the retitling in the Frank Reed Library. You're probably right, actually. It probably was that, because... Yeah. Well, I want to say I'd like to think that Sonorans improved a bit as he went on, but we don't really know if that's yeah, the case. Yeah, right. And he did get to start pretty young, and this is very clearly inspired by the steam man of the prairies oh yes yeah since 1868 so i think i also saw 1870s so that's probably more accurate yeah i do suspect that this is a republication of something earlier but i can't 100 percent confirm that so we're gonna say 1870s i think because of the proximity to the original steam man but also because it does seem like by the time we get to electric bob and his big black ostrich which is coming up <laughs> The genre was sort of a little bit past it, maybe. Yeah, yeah. And some people have seen that that is that one might be a bit of a commentary on that. I don't know if that how true that is. Yeah, it was hard for me to tell. I I don't know. They are all written in a very similar tone, and again, all on this cheap newsprint stuff. So it's not like Mark Twain actually publishing a, a book and having it sold in in those terms. No, these were cheap newsprint stuff available at rail stations, probably intended to be read once and then thrown away. Yeah. But so getting into the story itself, Frank Reed was a great inventor, but his son Frank Reed Jr. is even better. They have machine shops in Reedstown, where else? And they've had flying machines, electric wonders, and of course, the steam man. Frank Sr. thinks it can't be improved unless it uses electricity, but Frank Jr. thinks differently. And three months later, Frank Jr. is summoned by Pomp, who is their black servant and a very typical racist caricature of the time, written in that minstrel show vernacular that I'm sure you're all familiar with and can't stand. And We're all uh, supposed to like him, though. Yeah, right. No, he's, he's one of the good guys, but... And to be honest, I gotta say, he's the only character in this book that actually seems to have a little bit of internal... Thought process is yeah. happening. Yeah. So, even I guess if it we'll is, give him that. Yeah, a walking racial caricature. Uh, I mean, it, it is really astounding how racist this character is. And it, it does make parts of the text really hard to get through, I have to say. But Frank Sr. relates a story of this Jim Travers who once saved his life, and someone's framed him for murder, which he initially thinks is just a huge prank. I love this part. This was so, like, weird. Yeah. It, it just, like, it never really does anything like this again, but yeah. it's just like, oh, that's... <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. But Jim's been sentenced to death for a crime he didn't commit. Yeah, they basically they lure him into a room and then pour blood on him. Yeah. And yeah, then it's... they, like, break into his own house and, and, like, throw a bunch of blood everywhere so that when he comes home... He gets caught red-handed. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really the most bizarre thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the Franks must use the new steam man to pursue the real killers whose traces lead them west. And the murder seems to be this, like, inheritance grab type thing that you see in overly convoluted Jalo movies. Yeah. But Frank Jr. unrolls his steam man blueprints and Sr. says it's an, indeed an improvement on his design. So Jr. is excited about the adventure that awaits his wife 
not so much. I guess in some stories he's married, others he's not. The age of the characters in these stories is kind of unclear. Uh, some of the texts say that other Frank Jr. stories he's like 14, but if he's married he's probably not yeah. that young. So who knows really. But the steam man is unveiled. It's nine feet high and holds the shafts to a wagon at his hips like one would kind of carry a wheelbarrow. We also get an illustration of this on the front cover. So I do recommend if you don't want to read a really crappy novel, at least look at the front cover illustration because it is kind of neat. But the wagon is bulletproof, so that's very convenient for our heroes and can also store like stuff and provisions. So that's pretty cool. Like in the original Steam Man, the chest is the furnace, and after testing out by racing some cyclists, Junior sets off with Pomp and Barney O'Shea, who is a, another servant and another racial caricature, this time the drunken Irishman, who also talks in vernacular. So the eye dialect in this book is insane. Yeah. <laughs> These two characters, you have to say aloud in your head everything that they say, it just yeah. in order to figure out what it might be. Right. And that's not always a nice thing. No, it's not. <laughs> no, but no, I mean, there's there's supposed to be the comic relief in the story, but it just really comes across as being completely racist in the modern day. But they're having they a lot are, of they're always fighting with, with each other. Yeah, right. Yeah. They're always like they they have this sort of loving brawling brother kind of relationship. Mm -hmm. I guess yeah. it's kind of cute. Right. I don't know. <laughs> the, but Junior talks with Travers in prison, and he says he's distrustful of his nephew, Artemis Cliff, who is an avaricious villain, and a number of times has tried to swindle him out of his money. So Junior takes a steam man out west by a train, and now we're in the heart of the Sioux territory. So Pomp and Barney are screwing around, playing cards, and it turns out there are six aces in the deck, so there's a dispute over who's cheating. This turns physical, and they fall out of the wagon. And Frank realizes that a few hundred yards later, when he turns around, they're ambushed by natives. Barney makes it back to the steam man, but Pomp is captured, and Barney and Frank are in pursuit, with Barney shooting some natives, but ultimately they get away with Pomp. Junior says they are led by Chief Black Buffalo, who is supposedly the most bloodthirsty chief of them all, likely to torture and kill Pomp. They spot some cowboys on the horizon and decide to ask them for help, and when they do, the leader of the men speaks with a Spanish accent, and he knows who he is and why he's there. The chief says that he's not Spanish at all, but he's really Artemis Cliff. An American like you. Yeah. <laughs> and Frank Reed Jr.'s fallen into a death trap, and Artemis uh, is uh, the real uh, murderer. Uh, 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 uh. So we had a really early reveal for this. I thought they were going to do like a whole murder mystery thing, the entire yeah. T of the novel. But no, it's revealed pretty much right away that Artemis is the real villain. He makes a really stirring villain speech, actually. Yeah. It's probably the best part of the whole book. Right. But yeah. <laughs> it, it like really doesn't get better after that, but it's, it is pretty fun. You like the, the kind of cackling, a little bit of almost cappy villain -esque Yeah, the mustache it's, twirling. It's definitely there. Yeah. Yeah, real mustache twirling. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's it's pretty good actually, but yeah. yeah, I mean, do you think Cenarans imagined himself as Artemis Cliff? I don't know. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of hard to imagine what Cenarans was thinking. <laughs> what, what, what was he thinking? Yeah. Not much. <laughs> but it, it is kind of funny being a Cuban origin himself, right? And how did he imagine like this guy speaking and looking and yeah. stuff? It's just funny. Yeah, uh, it's hard to imagine. Artemis tells him that they're not going to leave alive, but. Frank and crew are able to outrun the pursuing cowboys and tire out their horses and then easily rout them with the steam man. So they're debating on whether or not to leave the steam man and go into the hills when all of a sudden they see two warring native tribes emerge fighting with one another. And they see Pomp is tied to a horse that just runs off from the battle scene. The natives don't pursue him, but the horse is headed for a chasm. Barney's able to shoot the horse just in time before it jumps off, and they are able to rescue Pomp. Pomp tells them when he was captured, he saw six white men with a woman, and told Black Buffalo she was a prisoner heading to Ranch B, wherever that is. Well, I guess it could be Ranch 5, too. I, I wasn't really sure where the B yeah, comes I never, from. Yeah, I never, never was clear on that either, but I kind of decided on Ranch B as well. Yeah, right. So Ranch V it is. So they start looking around for Ranch B. They spot a trap for them. Someone is going to roll a boulder off a hill onto the steam man, which they narrowly avoid, and Pomp and Barney shoot the cowboys who set the trap. I think Pomp and Barney must kill like 
four or five hundred people each over the course of this novel. They're just shooting yeah. everybody all the time. There's definitely a lot of bloodshed. Yeah, right. But you'd almost forget. I mean, it's just, it's not really described in gruesome detail. It's just sort of casually just done. Yeah, and in huge numbers, too. Like, yeah, it's kind of crazy how detached it seems to be from mass slaughter. The cowboys can't shoot them. So they're at quite the disadvantage, but they still appear to be surrounding them at the bottom of the pass. So the steam man makes their way out, and Barney and Pomp are just like mowing down the cowboys, killing dozens, hundreds, who knows. But they continue looking for Ranch B, and they come across a trail leading to some charred wood. And as they approach, they see the ruins of buildings and the remains of animals and people, all burnt and bloody. Probably one of the goriest scenes in the novel here. This had been Rodman Ranch, massacred by somebody. Could be the natives, could be Cliff's gang. They're not really sure yet. But Frank Reed decides to camp the night there. And Barney has his watch, and he spots a mysterious fire out on the plains. Barney alerts them, and they investigate in the steam man. As they get close by, the people by the campfire are shocked by the steam man's appearance, and they think it is the devil himself. But Barney and Pomp have a good laugh at all this, and Frank Jr. says not to worry. It's just the steam man, and the good guys are here, so all is well. They have the pleasure of meeting Sim Harmon, who is the leader of this band of vigilantes from Poker Gulch, looking for some ruffians. And they, too, are looking for Artemis Cliff. Junior fills them in on what's happened, and Harmon says they're there to avenge the massacre of Rodman's Ranch, as it looks like they carried off his daughter Bessie. They don't know what became of Rodman himself, but probably nothing good. Junior says the victim of the murder that Travers is in prison for is likely Rodman, and based on the facts of the case, Harmon agrees. They agree to work together, but must be strategic, as it's Harmon's 25 men versus Cliff's several hundred. Harmon knows where Ranch V is, and they agree to rescue Bessie. They decide to observe their numbers and strike when the cowboys are the thinnest, so they are able to shoot the defenders and get through the gate, capture the fortress, and rescue Bessie. Rescue the princess! Yes. <laughs> This time she's not in the tower. No, no. She's in some kind of wooden fortress here. Yeah. They decide to burn the ranch, but the cowboys are returning, so they quickly scrap this plan and decide they need to escape. Frank tells Harmon to escape through the back gate, and Frank will cover their escape in the steam mat. So they execute this plan, and Barney and Pomp again are mowing down dozens and dozens of cowboys. Yeah, they're really great marksmen. Yeah, they are. It's, it's pretty impressive. But Harmon and his crew managed to escape. Do you think the steam man needs some kind of machine gun attachments? Yeah. Well, we're certainly going to see that in one of the other <laughs> stories. Pomp and Barney are just firing away with their rifles from the safety of the carriage, which I guess is able to deflect any bullets that the cowboys shoot at them. So they're essentially invincible as they are able to run around in this gigantic, like, wheelbarrow type thing just picking off the cowboys with their rifles yeah <laughs> it's pretty bizarre imagery it is but the two groups decide to split up and frank takes a steam man 20 miles away and stops the camp they tell bessie of her father's death and she wants to avenge him during pomp's watch that night he decides to leave his post to get a drink from the creek and sure enough while he's gone a band of men flood into the camp and capture the steam man Pomp is engaged in a fight with one of the bandits in the river, and Bess is assailant and observes all this from a distance. He tries to figure out how he can rescue Frank, and deduces their next move is to attack Harmon, but is suddenly captured by the Black Buffalo tribe again, and it appears they're going to burn him alive. Meanwhile, Cliff is really having a grand old time being evil in the Steam Man. Yeah, and he just, loves it. Yeah, and he, he used to really be a train it. engineer, yeah. so he figures out pretty easily how it works. Yeah, and he's really thrilled. Yeah, having the but he doesn't want to keep the inventor around, yeah. though. You know, I guess you know he figures he knows all the secrets. So yeah, so yeah, he's, not, he's pretty much useless. Yeah. <laughs> so as they return to Cliff's camp, he exchanges some hostile banter with Barney, and Cliff says they aren't going to kill them right away, and maybe they're going to toy with them for a bit but his gang goes to pursue the vigilantes. Harmon has an otherwise good position, but he can't resist the steam man, 
but Bessie gets free and cuts Frank and Barney loose. For some reason, Frank and Barney thought of her being totally stupid or something up to now, and I guess they're like really impressed that she's able to act like a remotely rational human being. <laughs> so they take a club and an iron bar and smash in the heads of their guards, including Cliff, and allow them to recapture the steam map. They make their retreat, and again, Barney shoots a whole bunch of people. Cliff comes to and is able to escape out of the steam man and just like kind of rolls down the bottom of a hill. The steam man meets up with the vigilantes and they prepare for the incoming onslaught and the situation is looking pretty grim. The story then cuts back to Pomp, who is on a pyre about to be burned, when suddenly the cavalry shows up and saves him just in time. He's literally rescued by the 7th Cavalry. Yeah, right. They are the 7th Cavalry of the United States Army. Yeah. Yeah, so we get another introduction to a faction here. From this point forward, I think it's just the factions capturing and then saving each other just in the nick of time for the rest of the novel. It gets yeah. really tedious. Capture, escape, capture, escape. Yeah, yeah, just over and over and over again. Pomp tells the colonel about the situation with Cliff, and the colonel, Colonel Clark, is also after Cliff for his actions at Ranch V, so Cliff is not making a lot of friends here out west. Colonel Clark sets off to the plateau where Frank and the vigilantes are trying to repel Cliff's cowboys, and the colonel again saves the day here. It turns out he knew Frank as he tried to buy an advanced gun he invented from him, which Frank refused to sell him. The colonel is quite impressed with the steam man, and they again split up the colonel wanting to capture Cliff alive. Unfortunately, splitting up was the bad move as the colonel is ambushed and loses half his men. And <laughs> he says, Here my soul, go. this is not very good generalship on my part. And <laughs> indeed. <laughs> and he's right about that. Yeah. <laughs> Cliff's men appear to have increased in number quite a bit, even though Barney and Pomp shoot them by the dozens. I guess they have hundreds more somewhere randomly. I don't know how you can keep an army of like, 750 cowboys fed and all that but cliff's doing it and they yeah. have the colonel in another trap of death so <laughs> the colonel commissions a private to break through the enemy line retrieve the steam man and frank and get them to help the private returns he didn't find reinforcements but instead found a passage out and the cavalry is just able to escape under cliff's nose and the colonel intend to go back to army land and bring back reinforcements of 200 men so, meanwhile, Frank and Harmon are talking about what they're going to do and decide to wait for Clark at Willow Creek. A young vigilant, Walter Barrows, who is in love with Bessie, walks off with her, and suddenly the camp hears a pistol shot ring out. And it's another invasion by the natives. Frank brings in five of Harmon's men and the steam men, and he runs onto the plains, and the sight of the man scares the natives enough where the men he just brought out on board can shoot them. So, while the attack was repelled, Barrows and Bessie are missing, and they find Barrows' gun with blood on it. They decide to pursue, and Pomp spots a group of natives with Barrows and Bessie making for the mountains, and Frank goes after them in the steam man. The natives are too fast for them and get away. Meanwhile, another group of natives is fighting with the vigilants. Frank and Barney pursue the captors on foot, while Pomp keeps watch over the steam man. Barney picks a few of them off, and the remaining four are trying to get into a canoe. While they're able to get away, Frank gets a shot off and kills one of them. They're able to cut the canoe off around the bend of the stream, and they fire at it, tipping the canoe. Frank leaps into the water to save Bessie and Barrows, but he doesn't need to save them because the three captors had brought them on shore. Frank is about to rescue them when all of a sudden a hundred men from Red Bear's gang of Apaches show up over the hill. Frank and Barney try to make a quick retreat, and suddenly the vigilants sweep in and drive off the Apaches. Bessie and Barrows had been split up into separate captors, and Frank decides to pursue Bessie first. However, it turns out they're being led into a trap and forced to take a defensive position. Another death trap. Right, exactly. <laughs> Frank and some men covertly go up to the high ground and shoot the Apaches. They're able to drive them back and rescue Bessie. But Barrows had escaped on his own and shows up just then, so that's convenient. But then the cowboys show up, so in trouble again. <laughs> We're cutting to Pomp and the Steam Man. Pomp is afraid the Apaches will come en masse, so he takes the Steam Man and moves it to safety. 
he meets up with Harmon, and the cowboys are coming through, and Pomp takes a steam man away from them as they go towards Frank. He decides to help Frank, so he takes the steam man, and he's ambushed by two natives who he just shoots, and then comes up to the vigilantes and Frank. With the steam man, Frank and everybody are able to resist the cowboys, but their ammunition supply is running low. And they eventually run out of ammo, and they're all prepared to meet their deaths, but are saved at the last minute again by the cavalry. However, they're not able to totally rout the cowboys, who have a base in the hills that is very well fortified. But Frank says there's a better hill that they could go to, which has a more easily accessible peak, and is technically higher. So they all move to this hill and fire down upon the cowboys, causing them to retreat. Barney tells Frank that Bessie has gone again, captured by the cowboys. And Barrows goes off on his own to rescue her, but is shot at by a cowboy, narrowly missing his face. He takes his horse and hides behind a pile of rocks as several more shots ring out. The shots are coming from a cabin, and Barrow shoots one of the cowboys through the window. And after a while, it appears the cabin is deserted. And he's unsure if this is a trap or not, but it appears that the cowboys have indeed gone off somewhere else with Bessie. This is one of the few chapters that I think really does kind of break up with the monotony of the second half of the book. I don't know. It, <laughs> I guess it says a lot that... Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that's I don't cool. know. I, I, I sort of stopped... I kind of stopped halfway through. I'm like, okay, it's just capture and escape from yeah. the rest of the book. Yeah, right. And, and I, <laughs> I was writing what was happening, but then I just kind of stopped. Yeah, since, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, after this, Frank goes in pursuit of the captors with a steam man. At this time, Frank takes Pomp with him and lets Barney watch over the steam man. They're not sure where they went, so maybe they figure they're at Ranch B. But suddenly a huge black bear shows up and sneaks up on them and knocks Frank off a cliff. Pomp runs down the hill after him, and the bear stands up and growls triumphantly, which <laughs> oh, yeah, I thought was a pretty bear. Uh, yeah, funny scene. You've got to have a bear incident. Right, there exactly. was a buffalo incident and a steam man and a bear incident. Yeah, right. I think. Yeah. So. so, yeah, another bear encounter. The steam man's whistle blows, which distracts the bear, so Pomp just shoots the bear in the head. Uh, so that takes care of that. Frank, however, is holding on for dear life onto some rock, but he slips and gets caught on some jagged root. Pomp and Barney are able to lower a rope and pull him up, but they see some water flowing through the canyon below, and the cowboys are breaking a dam, holding back a lake. Barney moves a steam man out of the way, and they wait out the flood, but Cliff comes out and tells them they're in a death trap again, and to surrender. Oh. <laughs> However, they're impervious to the cowboy shots, and eventually come across cavalry, fighting with cowboys, and see Barrows fighting with Bessie's captor. The cowboys flee, Bessie and Barrows are reunited, and Frank helps the cavalry defeat the cowboys. Cliff is mortally wounded after refusing to surrender, and confesses all as he's dying. Frank Jr. says, quote, You've done a good deed, Artemis Cliff, and may God forgive you and your sins. So, kind of the gunfighter confessing on his deathbed type situation. Yeah. Bessie and Barrows marry. Travers' name is cleared, and all is well with the world. And we get the last line of the new steam man was destined to make another trip and become involved in adventures even more thrilling than these just recorded. And a full and detailed account of the second trip may be found in number two of the Frank Reed Library entitled Frank Reed Jr. with his new steam man in no man's land or on a mysterious trail. And we finished the book. Yeah. <laughs> I think we should get we should get something. For I think so. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this was and tedious. Now, how about another five cent book for free? Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, and another thrilling thing: the word choices are, <laughs> to say the least, they're very repetitive in this book. Yeah. And he uses so often the phrase, "And then a thrilling thing happened." <laughs> right. <laughs> and then it's you know used at the end to say, "If you want more thrilling things, see the next thrilling adventure." Right. Right. <laughs> and and then I saw it in. One of the other stories, too, and I was getting flashbacks. I'm like, oh, no, here we're in new Steam Man territory. Here. Yeah, right. That's pretty bad. Yeah, and there's a couple other of these on Gutenberg. I can imagine they play out like the exact same way. This might have been at the point where Sonaris was writing one of these every two weeks or so. It definitely feels like it's just formulaic going through the motions. Aside from a couple moments, the prose is just really dull. The whole capture and being saved at the last minute is... Yeah. Not only is the prose repetitive, but sometimes I feel as though 
it's the wrong word choice and yeah. just nobody bothered to fix it. Right. <laughs> that that happens a few times and I'm just questioning does he really mean that? Like probably not. You know, it's it's right. it's just weird. Like one time I saw captors instead of captives. And, yeah. You know, it's yeah. just kind of means the opposite thing, right? So Yeah, I can't imagine there was too much editorial oversight over these. No, I don't think there was really much at all. There was certainly some advertising copy though. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> some pretty good uh, advertising copy. We don't really, really see much of Frank really on his own and in action. We actually get more of Pomp than we do. Oh, yeah, we do. Frank. Yeah. Which is sort of an interesting choice because he's supposed to be the comic relief sidekick. Right. We've sort of come down hard on Sonarans, which is, you know, he kind of deserves. But it's funny because, you know, he has this rote thing that he says. He says... He won't sell any of his inventions, but he puts them in the service of the weak and oppressed. Right. That's just what he does, right? <laughs> so I guess that doesn't include uh, Apaches, though. No, it certainly doesn't. <laughs> the casual indifference towards, I don't know, I mean, I guess i guess it's part of that romanticism of the, the frontier west. Right. Where the pioneering man goes through and routes the enemy and clears land for himself kind mm-hmm. of thing. Yeah. The natives are always the first aggressors in these right. stories. Like, right. They're ambushing and they're sneaky about it too. They're not like, it's sort of implied that if they were just a bit more civilized, people like Frank would be nicer to them. <laughs> right. But because they make all this awful noise and brandish their stolen rifles and their bows and arrows, they just have to be put down, I guess. Mm-hmm. And that seems to be the attitude of these books <laughs> yeah. especially this one right now th- this one is i think the most egregious out of all the four stories we've read tonight as far as that goes though it is interesting how the majority of the people that are killed in this are white cowboys i guess like oh, outlaws yeah. or something like that again the numbers that they have is pretty incredible it, it, yeah. it's pretty much a whole small private army that frank reed and his sidekicks kill here yeah artemis cliff has this army and it's kind of weird like I think maybe it was just me, but I, I feel like one of the characters even commented at one point, like, why would people work for this guy? Yeah. <laughs> I think it was me wondering that. I, I feel like that's something that Louis oh, Sonaris right. didn't ask, yeah. but I, I'm not sure now. Did I dream it? <laughs> I don't know. I'm in a weird state this month, so it could be that I imagined that, but I just I feel like that came up at some point. Because, yeah. mind you, he does... He does let his ruffians sort of carouse around a bit, and it's sort of suggested that they they know how to have a little bit of fun out there on the frontier, so maybe they're just drawn to that kind of lifestyle, and he seems like a good leader. I don't know. So, whatever, man. It was pretty bad. Yeah, it it, (laughs) it was definitely a rough ride, but there are 182 of these, um, if you're really feeling masochistic. So he does get electric at some point. It would make more sense for the steam man to be an electric man, no? You would think. You you would definitely think. If they were ended up somewhere where there was no water, and there's nothing, they don't say anything about, like, shoveling coal into him or anything like that. Right. I mean, even the original Steam Man was thoughtful of, like, their water supply and their coal supply, whereas this, they kind of take the resources for granted, I think. They do say something about needing to fill him at a creek or something like that. Right. But it's interesting that when Pop really needs a drink, there just isn't any water around. Yeah. Like, why is that? <laughs> they don't seem to be prepared very well for this. Yeah. They just ran out of water, so, like, of course Pop has to drink, and he goes out. As soon as he gets out of the steam mat, he gets captured. Right. So, yeah, I don't know. Frank Reed is, of course, a better tactician than the colonel of the cavalry. Well, yeah, of course. Because he's our young inventor hero. Yeah. Right. The colonel's, like... His men are there to get mowed down, I guess, and sort of save the day. Pretty much, but, yeah. like, he doesn't really do anything good. Like, he's kind of crappy at his job, and he keeps failing. Yeah. I think they were introduced, really, as a deus ex machina. I'm sure he was just writing this stuff as he goes, and he needed something to get his characters out of an impossible situation, and he just introduces all other faction right out of the blue. Yeah. And that's really what it feels like. So as bad as this was, though... I do have to say, in some ways, I did prefer this to the original Steam Man, because it did seem to have a bit more uh, of a plot to it, and a bit more, like, going on. Steam knew the original Steam Man just seemed very plotting, and sort of, like, there was no real goal in mind, maybe getting some gold, I think, or something. Yeah, Uh, there's less treasure hunting in this one, that's for sure. 
whereas the treasure bit was a big part of the original. Yeah, I guess so. It, it didn't really, it didn't seem to factor in the story that much from what I remember. It just didn't really seem to have much actual plot. Yeah. Now, the original Steam Man is also a bit more wholesome than this, though, because it's got some of that like rags to riches quality to it. Right. It was this, you know, the young boy in the original Steam Man really doesn't come from wealth. He doesn't come from like a prestigious family that owns a town. Yeah. He's just, right. you know, it's just him and his mom. His dad's dead. He's also disabled. He's got like a damaged leg or something like that. Mm -hmm. So in a way, the original Steam Man is, a, is supposed to be an extension of him. Yeah, absolutely. And it's kind of a little bit clever, I guess, right. you know, and it, it feels a little bit more like heartwarming, I guess, in a way. This one is just bloodthirsty. Right? Pretty much. And, yeah. and also there's no... There's no obstacles to Frank on his way to supremacy. You know, he's already got all the resources. He's got his own well-equipped shop. His dad yeah. is, like, supporting him in all his endeavors, apparently. Mm -hmm. And just does what he does. And he's got a, a wife waiting for him at home. He's a pretty young guy, but I guess he's not that young in here. Right. So, right. Uh, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> it's just hard to find things to say about these. Because they're just, yeah, they're just very... The steam man is sort of interesting, but I'm already thinking, man, just put some batteries in there. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll get there in a later episode when oh, yeah. robots come alive. So we didn't really enjoy this one too much. And at the last moment, even though I said to myself, wow, I'd really love to wash the stink of steam man off me, I decided that I wanted to read something else and... In the last little while, I've really been getting into the short stories of Joe Lansdale, who is a writer from Texas, and he writes sort of horror, sort of sometimes science fiction. He likes to do westerns. He has some kind of contemporary novels. He's written a lot of novels, which I haven't read any of those yet. Read a lot of the short stories. His short story, Bubba Hotep, got made into a pretty cool movie that I think we've both watched. Yeah. That's a good one. He has a story, Incident on and Off a Mountain Road, that got made into uh, one of the Masters of Horror episodes. Uh, the story is pretty good, too. So he's got a, a really prolific body of work, and it's obviously very influenced by old westerns and old pulp science fiction. So I discovered he had a series of graphic novels that he wrote and then were illustrated by somebody else. And there's also a short story, which I think is sort of the inspiration for those novels. And it's called The Steam Man of the Prairies and the Dark Rider Get Down. And I decided to read this story. It's a fairly short novella, pretty much the length of the Electric Sea Spider story that's coming up shortly. Right. And what he's done here is he's played with a lot of the tropes he, he has an intro at the beginning where he says he's really influenced by not only the Frank Reed dime novels, which he refers to. I think I think he's referring to the original Frank Reed novels, though. Right. He sounds like he's referring to Frank Reed Sr., but I'm not sure. It probably doesn't matter. But he's also influenced by Jules Verne, H.G. Wells, Edgar Rice Burroughs, and Philip Jose Farmer. Uh, and I found that interesting. I definitely picked up resonances of those other authors. And Farmer is an interesting case because he was kind of known for sort of taking other people's work and expanding on it a lot. I can't remember a lot of the things he did, but I know that he has one book that's written under the pseudonym Kilgore Trout. And mm. he actually asked yeah. for uh, Kirk Vonnegut's permission to use that. <laughs> right. And he wrote this book, Venus on the Half Show. And there's a bunch of other stuff that's Kind of got a little bit of a fan fiction y whiff about it, but before that term sort of came into vogue. So, what Lansdale's done here is he's really shown a real knowledge of all the Steam Man kind of tropes, and he's kind of subverted them. And at the same time, he's incorporated a lot of really weird stuff. For example, the Dark Rider of the title, who's actually the antagonist, is, believe it or not, and I had no idea about this going in, but the Dark Rider is actually the time traveler from H.G. Wells' The Time Machine. Huh. And it turns out that all his jumping about in time and so forth has done something to the fabric of the cosmos and ripped a hole in space and caused all these weird manifestations to happen where 
time and space are all coming together in really weird ways and there is some kind of cataclysmic event incoming and at the same time it's turned him into some kind of vampiric creature and what the dark rider has done is he's gone all over this i guess area in the west somewhere and essentially killed everyone he's kind of like a vlad the impaler kind of figure uh, right. he likes to he likes to stake people and this beetle character and his three friends including john feather the native are in a big steam man and they're trying to stop the dark rider from <laughs> destroying the world i guess more or less yeah uh, well it seems more like a personal vendetta like it's really interesting because it's definitely written in a very pulpy style but he's having a lot of fun with it it's really really raunchy it's super violent and gleefully gory it's yeah it's it's but it's not not in the same way that the original books were it's not racist and it's just having a lot of fun with the conventions and having a lot of fun describing the depravity of this dark rider because he brought the morlocks with him so he right. has these apes that do his bidding and they're described i don't know if he did this on purpose but they're described very very specifically as white apes hmm. and they just kind of they're really stupid and they're cannibalistic and they do everything he says and of course you know he's wanting to kill the beetle and the infernal tin man as he calls them and there's a whole bunch of other weird stuff that happens. There's a spaceship that crashes. And the ending of the story really reminded me of the Italian movie Demons, where the guys from the shuttle are yeah. like, this, this woman in a, a van pulls up, and she's like, hop in. And they're like, who the hell are you? And then they look back, and they see these like crazy dinosaurs running towards them. And they're like, uh-oh, I guess we better get in. Yeah, And it's really entertaining and really funny. So, I mean, not everything really comes together, but I kind of feel like it's sort of silly to even comment on that, given the, the, the sort of tropes that it's calling upon. Sure. Yeah, of course. And uh, he's just having a whale of a time with it, having yeah. a lot of fun. The interactions between John Feather and Beetle are pretty great. Hmm. And, yeah, if you don't mind something that's <laughs> really raunchy and gory and definitely over the top, something good can come out of this. And it's really interesting that steam men still have a legacy to this day. And no, absolutely. Yeah. I think that he's turned this into a series of graphic novels. I don't really know anything about that, yeah. but the original stories is definitely worth a read. If you want something fun to come out of that, that's not just historically interesting. Right. All right. Well, something to recommend out of this episode. So uh, yeah. that's good. It's so, nice to yeah. have something to recommend wholeheartedly. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and Lansdale's a lot of fun. Definitely. A bit on the raunchy side, definitely not quite PC all the time, but you know, his heart's in the right place. He does a lot of social commentary in a way because a lot of his stories take place in the kind of backwoods, rural, southern communities and stuff like that. So he kind of right. puts in a lot of the ways that people talk down there and stuff. Yeah. And it's, yeah, but it's a good one. It's a good one. Cool. All right. I think now we're going to take a little break and we'll be back in a minute with Tom Edison Jr. and his electric sea spider. <laughs> 